it speaks into our lives. Lord, we pray that you would help us all here now to listen to what it has to say to us. Lord, we pray that you would teach us through it, that you would encourage us, where we need to be encouraged, admonish us, where we need to be admonished. Lord, we thank you most of all for Jesus, for the hope that we have because of him, as we shall see. Lord, it's in his wonderful name we pray. Amen. 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 I'm just going to go and turn the big light on because I can't read my Bible. I'll be back in a second. That's done absolutely nothing. Um, so we're just going to read the whole, uh, of, well, not the whole chapter one, from, from verse 12 through to the end. Is everyone there? Yeah. Good stuff. Let's read. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole Imperial Guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope, I will not be at all ashamed. But that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honoured in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labour for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Amen. Um, so if you remember, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Paul uh, opened this letter with his sort of prayer uh, of thankfulness and general encouragement uh, to the Philippians in the opening verses. Uh, Paul was sort of uh, exhorting and praying that the believers in Philippi would continue uh, as they have begun in the faith. But when we come to verse 12, uh, Paul turns the focus upon himself, right? Uh, not, not in any sort of narcissistic way. Um, quite the opposite, as we'll see. But it's, it's evident from Paul's words in these opening verses um, that his brothers and sisters in Philippi, certainly, uh, and likely around the Mediterranean, were worried about. Uh, they were worried about Paul. Why were they worried? Because Paul had been taken to Rome as a prisoner. By the, the, the frontline missionary in the early Christian world, that the faithful apostle uh, 
had been arrested by the state and was sitting in chains, waiting to what would have seemed most likely at the time, face his death for his faith. And in the early days of the church, right, you can imagine that the doubt and fear this would have caused across the early church. That they would have heard these reports of, of Paul's fate and feared for their own safety, wondered about their future, and would have been wondering why God wouldn't protect Paul from this. Right? Surely his, his tireless service for his saviour would have protected him from such suffering. They would have had worries and doubts, fears and questions. If this can happen to Paul, why not to us? If Paul's suffering like this, despite how obedient he is, how much worse might it be for us? And so Paul basically writes the Philippians, and the big thing he's saying is, do not worry. Because Paul is so aware, and he wants his audience to be as aware as he is, that everything that is happening to him, is happening to advance the gospel. It isn't happening because he's been punished. He isn't in prison because the Roman Empire is, is more powerful than Jesus. The reason he is where he is, the reason he has endured the trials and the suffering that he has, is so that the gospel might be advanced. Paul knows why he's going through all this. Um, Paul wants to make sure his readers know this too, that this isn't a mistake, uh, this isn't a failure for the gospel. Paul's saying, don't worry about me, worry about the gospel. And where I am is the best thing for the gospel. And now the obvious question uh, the Philippians would have had what, when they heard this is, is how? Right? How can the impris imprisonment of this veteran church planter possibly be a good thing for the gospel and paul answers that very question in the next verses in verse 13 and 14 but with two separate things right there's two reasons why this is a good thing for the kingdom of god first of all paul's imprisonment his failure by any worldly standard has meant that the gospel has been spread through the whole Imperial Guard, it says in the ESV. Um, now, the Imperial Guard were they were the guards who would have gone in, in and out of like the, the emperor's courts. Uh, it's the equivalent of I don't know if they have an official name. Those people outside Buckingham Palace with the funny hats. Do they, have a, do they have a name? I don't know. You know who I mean. They, these were people who had access to, to places that no one else did. Right? Somewhere that Paul had he visited Rome as just an ordinary citizen, wouldn't have been able to get a word. There's no way he would have been able to, to share the gospel in this place. And yet, because he is there as a prisoner, he has been able to explain and live out the gospel day in, day out, before the very people who were going in and out before the emperor himself. Only by being there in chains was the gospel able to reach the places it was reaching. This wasn't a mistake or a failure. This was part of God's sovereign plan. What was happening to Paul was happening to advance the gospel. That's the first way. The second way is that we see there in verse 14, that brothers and sisters are becoming emboldened by what has happened to Paul. Right? They're becoming more bold in their own proclamation of the gospel because they see what's happened uh, to Paul in prison. And the obvious question, again, is how? Right? That seems almost back to front. Um, surely seeing Paul being in prison would make everyone kind of on edge and they'd worry the same thing was going to happen to them. But it's Paul's joy and steadfastness in the midst of this that, that encourages and um, emboldens others. Right? And should encourage us too. Because in Paul, in this situation, we see that there is nothing this world can throw at us that can take away from the joy and peace that we have in Christ. 
Before Paul was in prison, people uh, might have worried about the consequences, uh, worried about uh, what might happen to them if they were persecuted for their faith. But seeing Paul's example, brothers and sisters are, are reassured that e even if they get chained up for years on end, even if they, they face death, they see that they can never be separated from the joy of the Lord. That they will never be in a place where they cannot continue to share the gospel and glorify Jesus. Right? There's an encouragement for us this evening. Right? No matter what this world throws at us, and we can be pretty confident we won't end up in circumstances as bad as Paul, at least not in the near future. No matter what sufferings and trials we must undergo, we can look at what it did to Paul and see that what well, it's by no means easy. It will never be hopeless. We can never be in a place where we cannot continue to serve God. We can never be in a place where the joy and the peace the gospel gives us will be taken away. So, so long as our eyes are fixed firmly on Jesus, on his plan, on his glory, nothing that happens to us can stop the advancement of the gospel. So Paul knows and wants his readers to know uh, that what is happening to him is still serving the gospel. He is still doing God's work and this is still part of God's plan. But we see in verses 15 to 17 that he, he isn't ignorant um, of how this is being done. Of those that have become more bold because of Paul's imprisonment, they, they fall into two categories again as we see in those verses there are those first of all who are preaching the gospel out of envy and deceit and there are those who are preaching the gospel out of love now, that first group right, there are people who are preaching the gospel and we need to prove that that it is the gospel they're preaching that these aren't false teachers they are proclaiming the truths of god's word and yet doing so for selfish gain the message isn't the problem, but the motives are. They hear Paul is in prison and they sense an opportunity, right, to acquire for themselves the fame and renown that Paul, Paul no doubt has at this point. That they see something in it for themselves and they go after it. And then there's others, right, doing it out of love who see Paul in prison and recognize that his time and energy, his ministry is being used in a different area uh, to where it was before. And so out of goodwill, out of love for Paul and for God, that they pick up the mantle, right? continuing the good work that Paul had started through the city. But the big thing about all this is verse 18, right? Where Paul says, what, what then? What, what do we make of uh, these two different groups of people? And Paul says, either way, I'm going to rejoice because Jesus is being proclaimed. And there's a couple of things we need to just be clear on. Paul isn't saying that, that means don't matter. Right? He's not endorsing some sort of any method will do method of evangelism as long as Jesus is proclaimed. What he's talking about in these verses is the source of his joy. Right? And this source of his joy is not in his own prestige, it's not in his own name, which is getting defamed by these uh, envious preachers of the gospel. The source of his joy is in Jesus Christ. And so long as Jesus has been put forward, Paul's joy will remain steadfast. Now, we, we naturally, I think, get protective of our own egos. I think we can get protective of the people we love and look up to. Um, and that, that's no doubt how many of the church would have felt towards Paul. Right? He, he was the guy who, who brought the gospel to them, who gave them everything he had to build them up in the faith. And so when people came along trying to take advantage of Paul's suffering, Many probably would have got protective of Paul, right? They would have been angry that, that Paul's name um, was being battered around 
in a slanderous way. But Paul's point here is to say to these young believers, don't worry about me. Don't worry if people are giving me a bad name. Worry about Jesus. And so long as he's being lifted up, our joy can be complete. Right? And that's an example we need to follow. Uh, to be willing to, to put aside our, our own egos first and foremost, but also be willing to put aside the names of those we look up to and to focus solely on Jesus. So it's not wrong to look up to people, but we must ensure that our ultimate concern is not for their glory, not for our own glory, but for Jesus' glory, for Jesus' name and for his name alone. So we see there that the joy that Paul has in the gospel, the joy that Paul has in Jesus, and that nothing can take that away from him. And then kind of secondly, in verses 19 to 26, we see the confidence that Paul has in the gospel. And we're just going to focus on that sort of famous verse, uh, verse 21, which I'm sure is familiar to us all. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Right, it, it's, a, it's a famous verse, it's words we all know, but, but what exactly is Paul saying here? What, what does it mean uh, that to live is Christ? Uh, and quite simply, I mean, it, it just means that Christ is everything for Paul. Uh, and everything means everything. Right, you see that his sole concern about his fate at the end of verse 20 whether by life or by death, what matters is that Christ will be honoured in his body. Just take a minute, right, to think about what that means, what that would look like in, in your own life if the only thing you really cared about was that Jesus is glorified in everything you do. At every decision you make, is it motivated by a desire ultimately to, to honour Christ in this life? I mean, we, we so often I mean, do things for, for, for short-term comforts, for fleeting pleasures. It's a question not, not of always um, what we're doing, but, but why we're doing it. But when we get out of bed in the morning, when we go to work, when you're looking after the kids, when we sit down for breakfast or dinner, when we relax in the evenings, what, what, what are we working towards? Where, where are we hoping that that will end up? Where, where is our end goal? And I think there's a way that the answer to that is always joy, right, and happiness and contentment. But we so often seek that, that joy in a worldly way. But Paul is able to rejoice. Right? He's full of joy in what seems like the direst of circumstances. Because everything that he's living for is Christ. But, but the really striking thing about this verse is the second half of it. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Paul knows what death means for him. Death means going to be with Jesus. So it's not something to be feared. It's something to almost be looked forward to. He yearns for the day when he will no longer live because the day he ceases to live in this life is the day he will be with Jesus forever. We've just got to ask the question of ourselves, oh, are you ready to die? It's not wrong to, to fear the means by which we might die, right? which in our fallen world is, is a painful thing. But if we fear what death will bring, then we do not understand the gospel. 
if we are not excited about what death will bring, we do not understand the gospel. If you dread the day that you die, then I think we've got to say that for us to live is not Christ. Because if we are truly living for Christ, we look forward with very eager expectation to the day we no longer have to endure the sinful world, but be with Christ forevermore. For Paul, and hopefully for us, that is far better. Ask yourself honestly, right? And if the answer is no, something needs to change. Because if we're not ready to die, we're clinging on to what this world has to offer. If we're not ready to die, our hope is in what this world has to offer. But if our hope is in Christ, if our hope is in what the gospel offers, then what comes after death will never be something we do not look forward to. So, so for Paul, and hopefully for us, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But, but this puts Paul in a difficult position, right? Because he very much wants to die, to go and be with Jesus. But he recognizes that, that God has him where he is for a reason. I mean, we saw that right, right back at the beginning at verse 12. God's got Paul in prison because God's got a plan for the advancement of the gospel. And Paul is part of that plan. And we are part of that plan. And so while our desire might be to go and be with Christ, we recognize at the same time that there is work for us to do in the here and now. So that, as we see at the end of verse 26, so that people will glory in Christ Jesus. In this case, because of, because of what Paul is doing, we want to go and be with Jesus, but we continue serving here so that the same Jesus who we long to be with will be glorified more by more people. That, that is why we continue the daily struggle and daily battle of the Christian life. Not just in some stoic endurance, just to try and reach the end but so that in everything we do, Christ Jesus might be honoured in our work. So we've seen the joy that Paul has in the gospel. We see the amazing confidence Paul has in the gospel. And finally, just in verses 27 to 30, we see the life that the gospel demands. Paul turns away from himself and his own um, struggles, his own conflict, uh, and back onto the Philippians. Uh, and he says, listen, right, whatever happens, make sure your own life is worthy of this gospel. If living is Christ, living must be for Christ. How we live matters, and how we live must be consistent with what we believe. But the gospel is undeniably good news. We've seen the joy and the confidence it has given Paul in the face of imprisonment and even death. But, but that doesn't mean it's an easy message to live out. Living for Christ, living in Christ, means we can expect the same treatment in this world that, that he himself received. Slandered and abused, mocked and scorned, beaten and shamed. Right, Jesus makes that call himself of, a, of his followers in Luke 9. To, to pick up their cross and follow him. There's nothing easy about this task. But it's one we must do. It's one that's worth doing. And if we see Jesus for who he truly is, it's one we will want to do. And Paul gives a little synopsis in these following verses um, of what this... Uh, gospel life looks like and the big thing right you see there in verse 27 is unity it means living 
as part of the body of Christ. Everything is done together. Everything is done in community. Everything is done alongside our brothers and sisters in Christ. But we don't live in isolation. We don't struggle alone. Um, I think the temptation is so often when we're having a bad day, I'm saying this because I had it today, is just to shut ourselves off from the world, right? And to just uh, go into isolation and struggle on our own. But that is, that is not the way of the Christian life. Because we live side by side. We stand side by side. Um, but we don't just sort of enjoy each other's company. United in the gospel, we strive forward as well. You see that at the end of verse 27. We strive together for the advancement of the good news of Jesus. We stand together, we strive together, and we suffer together. Right? We, we weep with those who weep, and we rejoice with those who rejoice. Paul writes again in, in 2 Timothy 3, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The call to the Christian life uh, is by no means an easy one. But like Paul, in the midst of those sufferings, uh, as we are suffering together, right, we, we rejoice in Christ. We continue to hold on to him as our hope. Uh, the suffering that we are to expect doesn't mean it's a good thing. It doesn't mean it's something we're to look forward to. But it is something we should expect. And it is something that when it comes, uh, we must know that, it, that it's still part of God's bigger plan. Just, just as Paul did right at the start um, of today's passage. He's in a miserable situation. But he knows that this is all still working for the glory of Jesus. We should expect suffering in the Christian life. And it's important that we're aware of that because the, the, other, the danger then is that um, we end up assuming that suffering is, is necessarily some kind of punishment or something. But just, you need to just remind ourselves of the situation that Paul is in. Um, James Montgomery Boyce says of Paul, Paul's suffering is neither corrective nor instructive. It was simply a suffering permitted by God so that the gospel might be spread to others. It's not something we look forward to, but God knows what he's doing. Suffering for the sake of the gospel is something Christ went through. It's something Paul went through. It's something Paul says all Christians will go through. But it's a suffering worth enduring. Because of the joy and the confidence that the gospel provides. Let me just close with the words uh, of Stephen J. Lawson. Who says the gospel is good news. But it is never easy news. It is a demanding call to repentance and faith. That requires a full sacrifice. From each one of us. You must give up everything but it is worth the sacrifice we make because it is the gospel that saves. It is Christ who is worth living for. It is a redeemed life that advances the gospel to the world. Uh, I'm just going to pray as we just close up. Um, yeah, let's pray. Father, we are encouraged and challenged by